Praise the Lord, Bridgeway. I said, praise the Lord, Bridgeway. And one more time for the Holy Spirit, praise the Lord, Bridgeway. It's good to see all of you who've made it into the house of the Lord here in Columbia, Maryland, in Owens Mills, Ricestown, Maryland. I think you ought to give yourselves a hand because you came out in the rain, and I'm so proud of you for doing that. You made it. I don't take it for granted. You made your, you got up this morning. You said, I'm going to go to the house of the Lord, and I'm not going to let the rain stop me. So uh, thank you very much for being here, and thank you for showing up in Owens Mills. And for those of you who are online, I ain't throwing any shade your way. Uh, we definitely want you to be there online. It's better uh, if you can be with us in the building, but we know you're all over the place and all over the world. And some of you are just lazy, amen, praise the Lord. So no shade at all, just direct insults from the pastor. If you knew you should have been here and you looked outside and said, I ain't getting wet. But other than that, um, messing with you a, a little bit. Um, we are talking today about fellowship. And we're in a series called Table Talk, Conversations About Home. Our theme for the year is come home. Come home to God, come home to church. And as we uh, walk through Acts chapter 2, verse 42, one of the things it says is that the new believers were devoted to fellowship. We're going to talk about what that means, but first let's bow in a short word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sweet Christian fellowship, and we pray that today you would uh, teach us and, and inspire us and remind us that we need one another and that we are indeed better together. We commit today's word to you, and it is in the name of Jesus we pray. Together everyone said amen and amen. I believe that Christian fellowship is a sweet revenge in a world that has gone mad, a world of division, derision, damage, a world where there is brokenness. And as a result of all the brokenness, as a result of all the division, I think one of the things that God gives the church is Christian fellowship. And it's a sweet revenge in a world that has gone mad. But in order to understand why fellowship is something beautiful that God has given us as a divine gift from heaven, we have to understand what fellowship is not. What fellowship is not. First of all, fellowship is not friendship. There is a distinct difference. Friends are people who you come together to build relationships with socially for a myriad of reasons. It could be companionship accompanying one another. It could be recreation, playing together. It could be socialization where you're hanging out together. Such relational connections are made through communicating and talking and uh, listening to one another, laughing together, and simply enjoying time together in emotional safety in relationships. Friendships are good, but fellowship is not friendship. Secondly, fellowship is more than just getting together with people and hanging out. It is also not the exchanging of services, where friendship uh, has more to do with social connections, but not the exchanging of services. And so a doctor-patient relationship, that's more of a professional relationship. It would not be defined even as a friendship. Now, uh, can you become friends with your doctor or with the, the clerk at the grocery store or with your boss or with your employee? Yes, you can become friends with people who are exchanging uh, social and, and, and commodities between one another as, as well and, and professional behavior and those kind of relationships, yes. But those can be friendships, but that doesn't necessarily make it fellowship. So fellowship is not friendship. Secondly, fellowship is not family ship. In other words, family relationships are blood ties between uh, family members who grew up together or relatives. Usually these relatives spent time uh, with the same parents or with a guardian living together growing up in their younger years. 
Usually they're blood-related, but all blood-related relationships doesn't necessarily qualify as family. You can have family and you're not blood-related, but you grew up together. You had the same authority figures in your life, much like a parent-child relationship. This could be generally defined as family, and family is good. That's what our theme is about, coming home, coming together as family. But it's just important to understand that fellowship is not friendship. Fellowship is not family ship. Fellowship is not acquaintanceship. And most of our relationships are acquaintanceships. You know, everyone's not a friend. Even if there are deeper social and emotional connections, everybody's not family where there are blood ties or bonding as relatives. Most people you know are probably acquaintances or maybe even colleagues. These are people who you know casually and you're acquainted with them through human, intera human interaction based on proximity usually. In other words, if you didn't have proximity with these people, you might not actually be interacting with them or choose to spend time with them at all. This could be like your neighbors, for instance. You can become connected to your neighbors, and some of them may become your friends. How do you really know when you move, you still stay connected to them? Those are the ones that were friends. The ones that you don't stay connected anymore with, those are the ones that were acquaintances. You casually know one another, uh, you, you talk to one another, you develop good human interaction, but they would probably fall into the category of acquaintances. And so we have neighbors and classmates and workmates, people who we know their name, we know things about them, and they know things about us. We need these kind of interactions and these kind of relationships to build into us socially as well. So acquaintanceships can be good. Colleagues and, and people that you're related to because of proximity, even in church, that can be a good thing. So Nothing is wrong with any of those. I just want to make sure that we have an understanding of what true Christian fellowship is. It's not friendship. It's not family ship. It's not acquaintance ship. So then what is it? And in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it says they were devoted to it. It says that these new believers in the New Testament were devoted to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayer. We'll talk about those two in the next two weeks, but they were devoted to fellowship. So what does that mean and what were they devoted to? And how does fellowship somehow uh, become distinguished from all the other human relationships? Now, this is where I'll go to the board to try to draw up some idea of what it could mean. When you're dealing with social interaction with other human beings, Friendship would fall in this category, and all the other ships that I mentioned would fall into this category of human interactions, but that's more of a horizontal connection with human beings, okay? So all those other ships, all those other relationships would be horizontal interactions. But fellowship is when you have God At the top, and so there, if this is you down here, and these are all of your other relationships down here, it's when you connect with God, they connect with God, and as a result, right here, you have fellowship. It's the connection of people together who are coming together because of God, where two or three are gathered together, and God is the center of that relationship, that's what makes it, that's what makes it fellowship. When you come together with other believers and your connection is centered on God, when you come together, that's what is creating what we call fellowship. Now, in 1 John chapter 3, we see this same terminology regarding fellowship. Now, remember, John was one of the disciples who became an apostle. And remember, they were committed and devoted to the apostles' teaching. What made an apostle? The disciples who followed him 
who walked with him after he rose again from the dead, these disciples that he had appointed and anointed to go out and preach the Great Commission were now the apostles, and what defined them as the apostles is that defined them as apostles is that they actually walked with Jesus. They heard him speak, they learned from him. And so now all these new believers are saying, So tell us what Jesus' teachings are. And they're hanging on every word. That was the apostles' teaching. But they were also committed to fellowship. Well, now John is writing his own book right before the book of Revelation in the New Testament. And if you have a copy of the scriptures, you want to go to 1 John with me. I'm going to read uh, verses 3 and following. But you'll see the term fellowship, that word koinonia, which means to share uh, together. And John then writes this. He says in verse 3, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard. See, that's how you know they were apostles. What we have seen and heard, speaking of Jesus, so that you also may have, here it is, fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. And so John is saying that you can have fellowship with us because we have fellowship with God. And so, again, they have fellowship with God. Now, these people come into a relationship with them, and together, if they have fellowship with God and with one another, that's what makes fellowship. But notice what breaks fellowship. If you pick it up at verse 5, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. We heard it from him. We declare it to you. God is light. In him, there's no darkness at all. If we claim to have, here it is, fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have what? Fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us. So what he's saying is we have fellowship with God, but here is an issue that can take place among us. While we have fellowship with God, we're here in the, in the middle and we have connection with one another, connection with God, but here's the thing. He says in verse 5 and, and 6 and 7, he says, listen, if you say that you have fellowship with God, but you live in darkness over here, then you're a liar. I don't like being called a liar. I'm sure you don't either. But his whole point is you can say that you have fellowship with God, but if you're living in darkness, he makes a declarative statement that God is light. So now you're out of fellowship with God. So the triangle doesn't work anymore, right? But here is something that he does, which is pretty amazing. What he does is he moves to verse 9, and in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, he says, but if we confess our sins, he is just and righteous to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, this is so cool that God would do this. What God is saying is, listen, if you live in, if you live in darkness, you don't have fellowship anymore, but because of one nine, you can get out of darkness and come back to the top of the triangle and have that fellowship again. And that's the beauty of God's mercy. Confession means to say the same thing as. So when I confess or I agree with God and say the same thing as God says about my sin, about my darkness, when I agree with God and I say, God, I'm so sorry, I'm messed up, I confess my sins, please forgive me, it says that he's faithful and he's just to forgive you. He, he doesn't deride you. He doesn't say, stay divided from me forever. He does the exact opposite. He, he says, come home, back in the fellowship with me. The door is always open. 
And so while I broke fellowship, because what makes fellowship is us connected and sharing with, with our connection with God, I break fellowship when I leave the light and go into darkness. But he says in 1.9 that if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You now come out of the darkness and back into the light and back into fellowship with God. Isn't that great? Isn't that good news that God allows us to have fellowship with one another and allows us to have fellowship with him again? And the door back to our relationship of fellowship with God is confession and forgiveness and cleansing. Has anybody ever needed forgiveness and cleansing from God? Has anybody known what it was like to break fellowship with God because of living in darkness? But this is what the text also teaches us. Even though he's saying in 1 John 1 that we're lying if we say we have fellowship with God but live in darkness, and that he allows us to come out of darkness into the marvelous light, he says in 1 John chapter 4 uh, something else. He, he's into this lying thing. And so when you pick it up at verse 20, if you go to 1 John chapter 4, verse 20, this is what he says here. We can pick it up at verse 19. This John, remember, who walked with Christ says this, we love because he first loved us. And if anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And he has given this, us this command, whoever loves God must also love his brother. So check out what's happening here. He says another way that we break fellowship is that we, uh, okay, we're, we're, we're right here, we're in the middle, it's all good, but guess what happens? We, we were connected with God and others, and we're out of darkness because of, forgive, uh, because of our sin, but something else. We move now from darkness, and we step out now, and to hate. And he's saying, listen, if you're saying you have fellowship and you're saying that you love me, but you hate your brother, right? Then guess what? You don't have fellowship with me. His point is sinning and hating is not consistent with Christian fellowship. And so if you're in, in darkness, this is sinning and hating. Let's spell that right. These things are not consistent with, with fellowship. And so he then, at the end of chapter 4, gives us a command of what to do. And he says, and he has given us this command, whoever loves God must also love his brother. So how do you get back? You get back to close the triangle by no longer hating and loving. And so what he's teaching us is that light and love is what keeps Fellowship going. And so if we're going to be a church where we have fellowship with God and fellowship with one another, we have to live in the light and we have to live in love. And that's how we stay at the top of the triangle where you and I can connect on a horizontal level. But because of my relationship with God, I can connect with you and God at the same time. And that's what creates what we know as fellowship. So you can see Christian fellowship then is defined by sharing experiences together with others in the light and the love of Christ. That's how I would define it. Sharing experiences together with other believers in light and love, in the light and love of Christ. That's Christian fellowship. It's one of the greatest blessings of the Christian life, and it's a sweet revenge in a broken world of division. And we just cannot have good Christian fellowship with others in our sin. Confession and forgiveness then helps restore us in our fellowship with God and each other, 
And Christian fellowship is when we're sharing an experiences in Christ together in his light and in his love. And we cannot have Christian fellowship alone. We can have fellowship with God, but if we don't have fellowship with our brother and our sister, we're not living out the fullness of what God has blessed us with as a Christian community. This is why when Jesus was asked in Matthew chapter 22, you know, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And he says that these two commandments are actually the single greatest command of all of the Bible and of all of the Ten Commandments. They fall into one of those two categories the commandments do. The first four commandments, loving God. The last six commandments, loving one another. And so what we're learning is that Christian fellowship is not something you do alone. And so you can't grow in your relationship with Christ if it's just you and Christ alone. Even Jesus had fellowship on the earth with his disciples and with his family members and people around him that were focused on their connection to the kingdom of God. And this is why Hebrews 10.25 says that we should not forsake the gathering of the assembly as some people are in the habit of doing. And when you're in the habit of not coming together with other believers in fellowship, you're usually developing other bad habits. Can I say it again? When you're in the habit of not fellowshipping with other believers, you usually develop other bad habits. And so coming together with believers helps remind you of what the light is. And it helps remind you of what love is. Because the world is about darkness and the world is about hate. And if we spend all this time in the world, then guess what? We've got people speaking in our ears who don't have light and don't have the love of Christ. And so then we start thinking like they're thinking. And before you know it, you're way out here and you're no, connect, no longer connected to the triangle. And this is why there are people who have left church and they have left God and they, they are living a philosophy that is completely antithetical to the word of God and completely antithetical to the ways of God. And it's because they are way out here. And because they're way out here, their philosophies are way out here. Their mindset's way out here. Their views of religion are way out here. And before you know it, they're into all kinds of religions and philosophies that have nothing to do with the word of God. And you can't tell them otherwise. Because until they come into a relationship with the God of the universe who creates Christian fellowship, they're not going to be able to understand you. And the further they come out here, the further they don't have the mindset and the understanding that is necessary in order to walk with God. And so this is why it's important for you to keep closing the triangle. Keep closing the triangle. Even when you're feeling hate raise up inside of you, close the triangle and love again. Even when you feel sin rising up in you, close the triangle. The devil is about trying to get you not to close the triangle. He wants you to feel ashamed. He wants you to feel guilty. He wants you to get out of fellowship. He wants you to be alone. He wants you to be isolated. And he wants you to think that nobody in the church wants you. Nobody in Christianity cares about you. They're judgmental and they're mean. And that's not necessarily the case. Are there some that are that way? Yes. But good Christian fellowship won't allow believers in Christ, those who are gracious, those who extend grace, those who need mercy. You see, if you close the triangle, you know what it's like to confess your sins. And if you're regularly confessing your sins, you're not going to be so judgmental of other people who haven't yet. You're going to talk to them about why you feel like you can walk with God again. Because I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. Yes, I was moving in the wrong direction, but God convicted me. And when that happens, the circle gets closed and the devil hates when you close the circle. Because when you close the triangle, when you close the circle, when you come back to God, you're in sweet fellowship again. And what God does is he gives us three major sources in order to help us grow in our faith. Three major sources. And let me write it down by 
creating some more space over here, but it, it'll be another triangle. God gives you these three sources to help you grow in your faith and in your fellowship with him. First of all, you have the word of God. You have the spirit of God. And you have, this is the fellowship piece, people of God. These are the three sources that God gives us in order to grow our lives in Christ. We need the word of God. That's what's renewing our mind. That's what we're learning when we go to Wednesday night alive. That's when we're learning when we're studying the Bible together with other believers in our, in our care groups, in our life groups, when we're in our Bible studies and in our classes. This is why even outside of Sunday morning, it's so important to develop a, a mindset of knowing what you believe and why you believe it and knowing how to turn to the scriptures that the pastor is talking about and getting in a devotional and then connecting with other people, right? So the word of God is going to be renewing our mind. The Spirit of God is a gift that has been given to every believer where the indwelling power and presence of the Holy Spirit is there to teach us, to convict us, to guide us, to lead us along the way. So we need the Spirit of God. So the Word of God is renewing our mind, and the Spirit of God is leading us and guiding us and convicting us and teaching us. But we also need the people of God. And the people of God are the other ones who are trying to walk the same walk where we're actually trying to grow in our faith. We're, we're trying to uh, keep a, a close triangle kind of a relationship with God. We need his, his word. The awesome messages you get on Sundays from, from the pulpit are absolutely special to you. We need Sundays. Sundays is what, what gets us going through the rest of the week. Sunday messages and sermons and worship is what refocuses us to the light and to the love of Christ and the word of God. And then beyond Sundays when we're in fellowship with others and studying, it takes it to the next level as we grow in our relationship with God, with the Holy Spirit, and with one another. And when we're with the people of God, it challenges us, supports us, and inspires us. A new kind of CSI. It challenges us, supports us, and inspires us. The kind of CSI you watch on TV is after a crime scene has happened. But this kind of people of God fellowship, CSI, is the kind that helps prevent you from a crime scene. And what about you? Do you have that, that fellowship with other believers? You see, the word of God and the and the Spirit of God is what sweetens that fellowship. And if you want to add to the fellowship, add to your learning. Add to your growth. Because as you grow, when you're in fellowship with other believers, it helps challenge them. It helps to support them. It helps to inspire them. And so fellowship is not just about what I can get, it's also about what I can give. How can I add to the fellowship in the triangle? Well, when I study God's word, I can now share in, in conversations about God's word with other believers. So yeah, I want to be a learner, but I also want to be a contributor. But I can't be a contributor if I'm never a learner. Then I'm always like, okay, tell me more, teach me more. That's good. But now contribute by saying, this is what I was reading this week. What do you think about this? So it challenges you. It supports you when you're going through a difficult time. This is Christian fellowship. And in Acts chapter 2, it says that they cared for one another when they had needs. That the people that they were in connection with who were committed to the apostles' teaching and were committed to being at home with one another, when they had needs, those needs were met right there among them. That's great fellowship. It's not just sharing and koinonia, but it's caring as well. And our care ministry is there. And I'm so proud of, of what Pastor Jen does and Rachel Maruka and so many others in our ministry who care for one another and deploy other people to learn how to care for one another because sharing and caring is the heart 
of Christian fellowship. And it's an encouragement to support you when you're going through such difficult times. They will support you, and as a church, we will support you the best way we can through prayer and through care and through the sharing of resources the best that we, the best that we can in your particular situation. But most of all, to encourage you to let you know you're not alone. You don't have to quit. So it's, it's, chal- it's a challenge that when you're in fellowship, one of the things it does is it does challenge you. It does support you. It also inspires you. When you see other people who are, who are ahead of you, who are or alongside of you, and they're trying to walk like Christ, doesn't it kind of inspire you to say, you know what, I need to walk like Christ better? Or there's a particular area where they're really good and, and God has really given them grace. They ha- seem to be so patient, and you're not. And you're like, man, that inspires me. I want to be more patient like that person. They seem to be more kind, and you're less kind. You're like, you know what, I want to be more like that person. Or they seem to be more selfish and self-focused. And you're like, you know what? They always seem to be others-focused. How can I be more like that? And so one of the things that Christian fellowship does is it it inspires you to say, you know what? I I can do better. I need to do better. Speaking of doing better, yesterday I was at Omega Graduate School down in Tennessee where I'm the chancellor, and I was able to, to do the commencement address. But what really warmed my heart was to see Pastor Jarrett walk across the stage. He got his doctorate degree yesterday, so give it up for him. I'm so proud of him. And I know he's not here, but maybe he's watching online. And uh, even Mike Perez, he had gotten his uh, master's degree. I saw him down there. So for those of you who might know that ministry leader. And and so something else that encouraged me, there was a guy down there graduating with his doctorate of, of social leadership, DSL. And he came to me and he said, Dr. Anderson, so good to meet you. I'm one of your listeners in Washington, D.C. And when I was driving through D.C., I heard you mention graduate school. And I've always wanted to go, but I just never really did it. But when I heard you on the radio say it, I decided to do it. And today, I'm graduating with my doctorate. And that just encouraged my heart that, you know, again, he was, in, he was inspired. And there's so many great uh, pastors that have gone to get their graduate degrees. And for those of you who who have been thinking, you know, I want to get my graduate degree. You know, Pastor Sandy got hers just about a year ago for her master's level with regard to theology. Even though she's working full time and, and, and doing ministry, she still worked to go get her master's degree. God bless you, Pastor Eli. He went to go get his master's degree, a guy who never thought he'd even go to school. And look, he's got his master's degree. And so I could start naming so many different people, and I won't be able to remember it all. But what I am saying is that when you're in the body, that inspires you. We've got so many great business people. I'd love to just name them and have them stand up and talk about their business because you've been thinking about being an entrepreneur. You've been thinking about increasing uh, your resources on your job or or increasing the, the way you do your profession. And there are people who are in fellowship here who have done that. And then you get to be in a life group with them or in a class with them and you find out, wow, maybe I can do that. Maybe I can be debt free. Maybe I can grow in my profession. Maybe I can do better in my business if I employ these business solutions, but do it in a Christian way. See, that's the beauty of Christian fellowship. And it's happening right here at Bridgeway Community Church. Well, listen, what have we said? We've told you what fellowship is not. It's not friendship, family ship, acquaintanceship. We told you what it is. It's sharing experiences together with other believers in the light and love of Christ. We told you the three major resources that God gives us, the word of God, the spirit of God, and the people of God, and the three benefits of Christian support with regard to the people of God, CSI. It challenges you, supports you, and inspires you. Let's end by just giving you a few practical uh, applications, and then we'll pray together. One Pray that God blesses you with two or or three good Christian brothers or sisters that you can share in Christian fellowship with. Ask God for that. You know, I'm again, I'm so blessed to have um, people that I can be in Christian fellowship with. And um, I don't know if I could have made it this far in my life or ministry without it. 
and, you know, having a brother that I, that I pray with every week for the last, I don't know, 10 or 15 years and, and having great elders and elders council of women that I can walk with and great brothers and sisters along the way that have walked with Amber and I through marriage, through parenting. You know, one of our great ministries here is, you know, the Ignite ministry, you know, and thank you, Fraylins, for being leaders in that. But you might be saying, you know what, I can do this marriage thing on my own. Well, you can, but watch out because it could be in darkness and there can be a lot of sinning and a lot of hating going on. And the worst thing to be is in a marriage where there's contempt between the couple. We don't like one another. In fact, we tend to hate one another. But what Ignite Ministry does is it helps you walk in your marriage in light and in love. And I could say that for our kids' ministry. I could say that for our children's ministry and our, and our youth ministry. What am I saying? If we're going to come home, then let's come home with a devotion to fellowship. Not just getting the words from the pastor or the clergy on the stage, but what triangle can I be a part of to help me to be challenged, to help me to grow, to help me take it to the next level? That, my friends, would be such an answer to prayer for you. So I would say just pray that God blesses you with two or three. I would also say, secondly, pray with other Christians. Pray, pray with uh, other Christian family members. You know, ask people, hey, how can I pray for you? That question never gets old. You know, how can I pray for you? And pray with one another because, you know, prayer is the basis of Christian fellowship. And in two weeks, we're going to talk about prayer, and we're actually going to pray because God's leading me that when we talk about it, we're going to do it. I would say a third and final application is to thank God for the blessings of Christian fellowship. If you have two or three brothers or sisters in Christ that you get to walk with, man, don't take that for granted. There are a lot of, a lot of Christians who are alone out there and they don't have the kind of fellowship that some of us may actually take for granted. And so the way you keep from taking things for granted is by saying thank you. And so thank God and say, Lord, thank you for the sweet revenge of Christian fellowship. Because with this Christian fellowship, I'm going to do my best to stay in the light and to stay in the love of Christ. The way I'd like to end it today is for us to pray in unison together. And this prayer is something you can follow me in praying before I walk off of the stage. It won't be up on the screen. So if you want, you can, you can close your eyes and just say it with me. And then we will be done. But instead of just talking about being thankful, let's actually be thankful. So repeat after me, even at Owens Mills right now, even in your homes or in your cars, wherever you are. Say this. Dear God, thank you for Christian fellowship. Thank you for my brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you for a church like Bridgeway where I can worship together with others who are following Jesus Christ. Thank you for the privilege of sitting among believers who need you as much as I do. Dear God, our Father, please help me be more loving as a Christian sibling. Dear Jesus, Son of God, please help me be more forgiving as a Christian sibling. Dear Holy Spirit, please help me to be more patient as a Christian sibling. Oh God, thank you for your love. Thank you for your forgiveness. And thank you for your patience. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Put your hands together for good Christian fellowship. Good Christian fellowship.